<clears throat> that song was a dedication for Floyd. She's uh, standing in the presence of the Lord. She was 99 years old, and she wanted to be home with her Lord. And um, God, in his graciousness, called her home. And that's our hope. Our hope is in the Lord. We don't know how many days we have in this world, many or few. So it's very important that we utilize our days wisely, walk wisely, serve God with all your heart, and let him be the Lord. Let him count our days. We rejoice because she's with the Lord, but in one sense we're also sad because she's no longer with us. We'll be reading in Revelation chapter 13. If you have your Bible, I, I encourage you to turn and uh, have it in front of you. Also, it's very important to have a notepad and pen. Take notes because you can follow up. You can have a uh, personal Bible study about this later on during the week. So turning into your Bible, Revelation 13, we'll be reading verses 11 through 18. Please stand, would you, here in the presence uh, in honor of God's word. That's something they did in the Old Testament when they were rededicating the temple, uh, coming out of captivity, and it's a, I think it's a good practice. Starting with verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns, like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Please be seated. I don't do this very often, but uh, just as a... Um, Idea. I wanted to give a title today's sermon, and I, I, I'm going to call it The Good News and Fake News. And in looking at this passage, I saw a lot of similarities. The one thing that we're going to look at today, we're going to see that there are four distinguishing characteristics of Satan's reign during the tribulation. Four. First of all, we're going to see how he misdirects power and authority to him. He also has deception as his main tool. He forces allegiance to his name unswervingly. It's all or nothing. And there's death to all that resist. So those are the four things we're going to talk about today. Starting with verse 11, it says, Out of the earth. Now, this beast, in contrast to the first beast, 
who came out of the sea. This one comes out of the land. Now, some have tried to say, well, maybe they mean the promised land. Maybe he's a Jew. But I can't find that in Scripture that there's an inference to that. But there's the thought that in opposition or, or in connection, the sea and the land, that is where these beasts come from. They, so they encompass the whole of the earth. But this lamb, or this beast who has two horns like a lamb, he portrays wisdom. We talked about that. Horns are wisdom, power, and authority. So these horns, he portrays wisdom. And he applies it in a religious role. We'll see more about that in a minute. But he spoke as a dragon, if you see here in verse 11. And he spoke as a dragon because that's where his empowerment comes from. I call him the false prophet, even though it doesn't say that here. It just says another beast. But he's identified as a false prophet in, in chapters 19 and 20. So we'll, we'll also tie that in. And because of this, he misdirects authority to the beast. Looking at verse 12, it says, And he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. This fatal wound, you remember, was there was a supernatural healing and restoration. Who else had a complete death and resurrection? Jesus. So what the false prophet is doing is he is doing a similar explanation. Follow this man. He was like Jesus. He, he died and he's alive again. And the false prophet also produces great signs as you read them here. Calling fire down from the heavens. Elijah like even. 1 Kings 18 has that story of the, the prophets of Baal. 600 of them if I remember. And Elijah. One prophet of God. And he calls down fire from heaven. And because of that, some people are going to buy in. They're going to see similarities. This has to be real. Look at these miracles. What other choice do we have? Walvert says that this is a false religious system. And it's imitating the divine trinity. You have Satan seeking to take the place of God the Father. And the first beast, the Antichrist, assumes the place of Jesus Christ, the Son, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And the second beast, the false prophet, has a role similar to the Holy Spirit, who causes Christians to worship God. Walbert said, this is Satan's final attempt to substitute a false religion for true faith in Christ. But he has his result. Look at verse 14. It says, He deceives those who dwell on the earth. I did a word study on deceive. Interestingly enough, deceive is a method of communication. And when it's communicating and you're deceiving, you have a marked departure from, inform from informing. You go down, you have a road, and it has two forks, right? One left, one right. Sign says to Holtville to the right. <laughs> Someone takes that sign, flips it around, and now it says Holtville's to the left. You have purposely set out to deceive somebody. And it's marked. You can see the point of departure. To deceive, it's a marked departure from informing. 
Now, you can use a variety of words to communicate truthfully. There's a number of them. You can announce something. You can explain. You can notify. You can recount. You can report. You can teach, tell, and testify. And you can warn. They all fall in the same art of communication. But false information comes in two forms. To lie and to deceive. And the results of that is to betray the other person. To cause them to wander. To mislead them. To delude and ensnare them. Then it hit me. This is what we're seeing in our society today. Fake news. I don't want to get political, but I do have an observation. And I do have my opinion that there are information outlets taking advantage because they're taking words and stories, news stories, and they're using them as weapons. They're deceiving people. And this is coming from what used to be considered reliable sources. Their intent now is to distort with the intent to sway your opinion, to, to, to change your perception of reality. You know, we used to rely on news reporters to tell us truth. We believed it when Walter Cronkite ended the evening news with... And that's the way it is. I practice that, by the way. Edward R. Murrow was a TV news reporter in the 1950s. And in 1958, he said these words about television in a speech to the RT DNA, the Radio Television Digital News Association. I would probably tend to believe that the digital news wasn't in there. It was probably just the RTNA at the time, but they've added the digital. But this is what he told that association as their keynote speaker. He said about the TV, this instrument can teach. It can illuminate. Yes, it can even inspire, but it can only do so only to the extent that humans are determined to use it for those ends. This was a warning over 60 years ago concerning the role and the responsibility of news reporting. And this man is recognized as one of the best in his field, the pioneer of journalistic broadcasting. And because he's recognized for his excellence, there is an honor called the Edward R. Murrow Award given for outstanding achievements in broadcast and digital journalism. He knew what he was seeing in front of him, and he put the words out. Today, how have we done in the world of journalism? I would say we've failed. Journalism is prejudiced. It doesn't report. It reviews and rewrites. It's skewed politically both ways. And quite often it's morally bereft. Other than that, it's surprisingly good. Today it's difficult to sift through information because you'll find that along with the truth, different news outlets will promote their version of truth in an attempt to what? Deceive and delude. I want to admit I was shocked when I first made this connection when I started studying the word deceive. But there's an application for us today. What you feed on will determine your health. And that goes for your information as well. So I encourage you to choose wisely. So verse 14, Satan will deceive those who dwell on the earth. He will use this to produce a false narrative. 
He will deceive the world by using the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. The Antichrist sits on the throne in the temple. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. And we'll actually be reading verses 3 and 4. 2 Thessalonians verses 3 and 4 says, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come. That's the day of the Lord, his return. That it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. He sits in the temple, God's temple. And the false prophet sets up a statue of him as well, perhaps even in the temple, to keep his image in front of the people at all times. So let's look at some additional scriptures concerning the desecration of the temple. Daniel chapter 11 prophesies the actions of a king desecrating a temple. Daniel 11 verse 31 says, Forces will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress, and do away with the regular sacrifice. And they will set up the abomination of desolation. Look in your ministries. Has a huge amount of Bible study materials and devotionals, Ligonier Ministries. You can use these to supplement your daily reading and your personal Bible studies. And this is what they have to say about this passage, about the desecration of the temple. This event happened by the Seleucid king Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, in 168 B.C., he invaded Jerusalem and captured the city. He marched into the Jewish temple. He erected a statue of the Greek god Zeus. He sacrificed a pig on the altar of incense. This act brought about the Maccabean revolt. And the Jews drove the, Greeks out, the Greek armies out. And then... It gave Israel approximately 100 years of sovereignty before the Roman armies took control in 63 B.C. All this happened by the time between the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, was written and the advent of Jesus Christ for the New Testament. 400 years. It's called 400 silent years. It was anything but silent it's a good study. It's great reading. I recommend it. But it's notable that Daniel's prophecy also provides a time frame. Times, times, and half a time. We've seen that before. A one year, a two years added, and a half year added for a total of three and a half years. That's in Daniel 12, 7. And then, actually in verse 11, it restates another number, 1,290. So 1,290 days is actually 43 months, not three and a half years by the Jewish calendar. Not actually the times, time, time times, and half a time. But this doesn't mean that the Bible is fraught with errors, that people couldn't get their numbers down. Many scholars believe that the additional days are the days of judgment after Christ returns until the setup of the millennial kingdom. There's a time of judgment, the sheep and the goats. And that's why this verse always says that there's a blessing for those who keep waiting and attain to the 1,335th day. Now, does this completely answer the variation of days? Probably not. But I'm going to let God handle his economy. And I'm just going to preach what I see in the text. Okay? And now, another observation in the Gospels 
is when Jesus comments about this event in Mark 13, 14. Mark 13, 14, he says, uh, the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be. And I believe that's a direct reference to this Revelation 13 passage because the, the time of Antiochus IV has already passed. So why would Christ be talking about a future event if he is referring back to that? So we see a dual prophecy being fulfilled Antiochus IV as a type of Antichrist and then Revelation 13 when it is the Antichrist. And so now we have this image of a beast in the temple, residing in the temple, I believe, from what we've just read. And then all those who worship, or excuse me, all those who refuse to worship are killed. Verse 15. And there was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast might even speak and cause as many do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. This is forced allegiance and also resulting death to those who refuse. Verse 16 talks about the mark of the beast. Everyone is to receive a mark of the beast, either on their forehead or on their right hand. Now, this mark, be it a tattoo, a computer chip, is some sort of identification that allows everyone to buy and sell and conduct business. And in taking it, in accepting it, it's an acceptance or a statement of allegiance to the beast. And to risk obeying, to risk not obeying the Antichrist is to put yourself in danger of death. And that's clearly communicated. This will be a perilous time for those of the faith. I almost think about how during the Holocaust, how Jews were being chased and, and killed. But some, out of respect, hid them, protected them. I kind of assume that there will be a, a sense of that to those going through the tribulation. And this number 666. John Walvert says that probably the best interpretation about this number 666 is that the number 6 is one less than 7, which quite often displays the perfection of God. It's displayed in creation. Six days the Lord created, seventh day he rested. One complete week. Perfect. The threefold repetition of six, though, shows that each six is one less than perfection. It's the sign of man. Threefold representation would indicate for all of their pretensions to deity, Satan and the two beasts are just creatures, not the creator, and they fall far short of perfection. Verse 18 in the New Living Translation says, wisdom is needed here. The Greek word is Sophia. Sophia means prudence, understanding. Not gnosis, not gnosis, where that stands for knowledge. So the type of wisdom here that's being spoken about is the ability to utilize knowledge and experience and common sense to gain insight. You have to have perception in order to understand this at this time. Definitely not a secret. It's not like a, a wisdom that can be gained by only a few informed or enlightened individuals because while there is significance in numbers, and we see that God uses certain numbers over and over, 40, 7, we have to be cautious about trying to find secret meanings in numbers. And there's actually a word for it when you try and do that or applying secret code. That's called 
Gematria. And if you watched any of the Nicolas Cage movies of National Treasure back in the day, that movie or its sequel, I, I looked online, they're actually planning a third one right now, please. But if you've watched that, you can get a sense of how people were utilizing hidden messages and messages in code. While I do like good fiction and mystery, I do not believe it's very smart to apply that into my Bible. I don't need to find extra information that's not there. You can fall into interpreting your Bible by allegory. That's to take and spiritualize a passage. And it spiritualizes it away from its true or its main meaning. Allegory, allegory typically tries to tie in the Old Testament with the New Testament in some strong way. Using allegory, you can come up with the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is the Ark of the Tabernacle, carrying the Word of God. That's trying to put too much information into the fact that Mary conceived of the Holy Spirit and gave birth to Jesus. Mary was the mother of the incarnate Christ. So during the tribulation, identifying the Antichrist will not be difficult. There's much to be learned, though, concerning his actions. Seeing his elevation to power, his peace treaties in the Middle East, and then his turning from being advocate to adversary. His anger towards Israel will become very apparent. And his insistence on people worshiping him leaves no doubt who this evil individual is. It will be the faithful, the martyrs of that day who will have to deal with them. The martyrs identified in Revelation 6 crying out to God underneath the altar in that vision. O oh Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? I don't know the number of how many are killed because of their faith during this time, but it will probably be the majority of those believers during the time. So this passage marks of Satan's reign during the tribulation. Four keys that we talked about. That he misplaces power and authority away from God towards himself. That he deceives the people with the purpose to delude them away from God. That he has a forced allegiance. His way or no way at all. And fourth, finally, death to all who resist. He doesn't incarcerate them. That would take money. He just kills them all. So today, if we take the temperature of society around us, and we see a measure of hostility towards people of faith, we can see how society is stacking up against Christianity. We could probably multiply that by 100 and fall far short of what is going to happen to the believers of the tribulation time. So what are we to do today? What are we to do about this? Are we to hide and stay out of the limelight. We've been told to stay home, but does that mean we have to shut off everything and, and, and become a hermit to the world around us? No. We're to redeem the time wisely. So what is it that God requires of us at this time? 
We are ambassadors. Remember that. <laughs> we carry the title that God has given us. We're all ambassadors. So, we represent Christ to a fallen world, no matter what the outcome is. I was looking ahead to chapter 14 next week, and we're going to see 140,000 witnesses, and we're going to see women who have not defiled themselves and have kept themselves pure for God. We can see angels in the heavens proclaiming the message of God. And we see the promise in verse 13 where it says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. God has never promised us fame and fortune. He's never promised us a land of milk and honey. He's never promised us health and safety. He said, take your cross. Bear it and follow me. When you pick up your cross, that is your allegiance to, to God, to Christ. When you carry that cross, this cross is heavy. It's burdensome. It's not easy. And still we do it. No matter if it makes us sweat or bleed, no matter if we, we struggle under its weight, because any of the suffering that we have in Christ does not ever measure up to the amount of glory that we will share because of Christ in heaven when he calls us home. How many years do we have on this earth? It's a shame when someone dies early due to illness or accident. And it's even difficult when someone like Floyd at 99 goes home. But doesn't matter. Eternity is eternity. We're just a pencil speck on the timeline of history. Because of that, use your time wisely. Choose each day when you get up. Choose to follow God for each day. Don't promise to follow God next year. It may never come. And don't worry about what happened last week, how you perhaps didn't take advantage of that. That will only weigh you down in regret. Each day, choose to follow Christ. We all have that as an option. We have this future. We have a home to look ahead and a whole new family of believers. And that's what I choose. That's what motivates me. I know my, re my Redeemer liveth. Christ rose again from the grave after paying for my sin. And he offers me a new life. He offers me forgiveness for my past sin. He actually offers me forgiveness for my future sin as well. He's paid the price for that. So because of that, we choose to follow him and to become more and more like Christ day by day. We're being sanctified after being justified. He declares us righteous. And then he says, go about and grow into this. Mature as a Christian. Day by day. Paul says, have I attained it? Have I attained it? No, I have not yet attained it. But I press on. That's Paul. Paul said, press on. We're going to do the same. We're going to press on. As God gives us breath. As God gives us each day the opportunity, we're going to press on. As we get ready to close, though, I want you to think about this. How you can press on. What you can do differently in your life to grow closer to God. 
We have a lot of opportunity ahead of us. Let's take advantage of that. As the worship team comes, let's, let's have a, a word of prayer. Father God, we just want to now commit to you this passage of Scripture. Father, we want to thank you because you've written it for our edification, for our study, so that we can endure what we're going through. And Father, now we just ask that you would give us each day as an offering to you. Father, I pray for my friends, my family here, and anyone online listening. I just pray, Father, for your word to become more and more enveloped in their life. Open it. Cause them to see who you are and where they need to be. For commitment to be made, for recommitments to be made, just a dedication day by day. I just thank you, Lord, for these things. Watch over us and protect us now as we go into the week. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the time today that we, in your word and revelation, the things you've revealed, um, help us to take them to heart and, and uh, just remember the blessing you promised for those who do read and, and heed this, this book of the Bible. Um, help us be prepared for whatever you call us to in the coming weeks and months and years. We don't know what will transpire in our time here on earth, but we know that you're in control. We thank you for that. Um, thank you for your love and our time to share um, together today. In Jesus' name, amen.